Well, welcome to the Awesome Earth Kind podcast. And if you would, please introduce yourself, let folks know who you are, where do you live, and what kind of work do you do? I'll go first. I'm Richard Perez. I'm a research professor at UAlbany Atmospheric Sciences Research Center. And I've been doing research in solar energy since the 1980s and continue to do so now. I, I did that before it was fashionable to do so, and I'd say it's a big business and growing fast. Wonderful. And Eva? Thank you. Um, so I'm Eva Hoskin. I live in Burlington, Vermont. I am the executive director of a nonprofit called the United Solar Energy Supporters, in addition to working for USES, for short. Um, I also do public outreach um, in Pennsylvania to help build support for solar projects in that area. Um, a quick bit about United Solar Energy Supporters. We are a 501c nonprofit organization um, who is a grassroots network of advocates who want to support, grow, and educate on the value of harvesting sunshine for emissions-free electricity. Um, we work to fill in the gaps of comprehension of solar energy through um, many different education and outreach um, efforts. We don't lobby, we don't advocate for specific projects. Um, we stay a trusted third party group um, to provide education for all. I am, I'm the executive director and Richard Perez is one of our board of directors members. Um, we're you... backed by, by a very great board of solid experts and technical advisors. Outstanding. Thank you. Well, we're looking forward to digging into solar and all the different things you guys got going on, especially Richard's study. But we like to start with, we call them a quantum quote, an inspirational quote that kind of frames people's mindset. And uh, would you guys care to share one of yours? I'll start again. My, my quantum quote for, for today, the one that's most applicable to my work is look, look at the numbers. Always look at the bottom line, the numbers. Always look at the numbers. Because that's the best way to back up what you say. Outstanding. Eva? So my quote is one that we at USES like to use very often, um, really embodies a lot of our work. It's a Margaret Mead quote that you probably are familiar with. But um, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Indeed. Yeah, I like that. Yes, indeed. It's a great quote. And uh, yes, indeed, it's an inspirational one for all of us to keep in mind always. All right. So, Richard, Dr. Perez, if you would tell us, why did you do the study? And uh, tell us why first. Why, why, why do you do this stuff? OK, so that study, which uh, title is uh, the, uh, comparing the energy reserves of the planet. Uh, we did an initial study for the International Energy Agency back in 2009, had an update in 2015, and now we are publishing the third update, and we do that in a, in a form of a peer review article in Advances for Solar Energy. And the reason why we did that study is initially and still continue to be true today is to dispel common misconceptions about solar energy as to being a small niche when in, indeed it's the largest resource by orders of magnitude. So great. So tell us, okay, so tell us what you did and what this study found, if you would, please. So we, we looked at everything that can generate energy on, on the planet Earth including all the traditional resources like oil, gas, uh, nuclear energy, coal, which are the finite resources. We looked at all the renewables. And of course, we looked at solar and we quantified that in terms of availability. Uh, what we found in, in the first study and what we keep finding today is that solar dwarfs all the others by orders of magnitude is bigger than all the other resources combined, including the, the big finite resources like coal and nuclear. And the great thing about the sun is that it uh, does that day after day, year after year. So it just keeps yes. pumping it out, right? So mm -hmm. 
Yeah, actually, I uh, I was first exposed to your work in the 90s, and um, I was just blown away when you came out with that study, and uh, great graphic, by the way, which we animated and have on the awesome EarthKind site. If folks want to see how much energy is left, it needs to be updated because it's out of date at this point, but, um, but still, it's just amazing to see. Um, so if you were to categorize it in a nutshell for folks that are listening, so how much coal, oil, fossil fuels, uranium, uh, limited resources are left, and then how does that compare to to solar and to other renewables? Okay, so for, first the new twist in the new study is that we focus on the idea of reasonable. So instead of counting every bit of solar energy that fall on earth, we counted the one that could be reasonably recovered after accounting for efficiency, land use and all that. So it, it's a much more actionable number. But even after that, uh, we there is more solar available for deployment than the finite resource by a factor of, uh, I'd say, 100. If you count over the 30, next 30 years, you could generate 100 times more solar energy than you could from any of the finite resources. And so the, the question with solar always comes up, okay, one, uh, costly, two, um, not around during the night. So how did you look at that and how do you counter those two pieces? Okay, of the... so in that particular paper, we just looked at availability, but we published extensively on the 24, 365 issue. We have and that's, that's what I'm driving most of my research these days is how we, we recognize that solar is affected by clouds in the season and sometimes for 10 days in 20 days in winter, you don't have any sun, but what you need is something that's available all the time at night and on cloudy days. And there are ways to make it happen. In fact, very elegant ways. You just have to think outside the box. We just were just completing a study for the Swiss government where their objective is to grow their electrical demand by 30% in the next 25 years, get rid entirely of nuclear generation, which currently powers almost a third of Switzerland. And the only way they are thinking of doing it is can PV does the job? And we find out that PV can do the job indeed 24 hours a day, 265 days a year, with a bottom line generation cost for Switzerland around seven to eight cents per kilowatt hour. So I'm not sure what the prices are in, in uh, Switzerland, but how does seven, eight cents compare to what they're currently paying? Okay, so currently in Switzerland, uh, costs on the TSO, the transmission system operator, the wholesale cost of electricity is about 30 cents per kilowatt hour. Wow. So that's a little bit artificial. It's because of the, what's going on in Ukraine and the, the restriction on, on gas and, and the like. But, but still, if you look five years ago, it was five, six cents. And those costs did not uh, account for any externalities associated to that. So they, that's five, six cents with all the environmental price that society pays in other ways instead of paying directly plus all the strategic externalities. And we're seeing that big strategic externality today as if there is a little bit of international pressure on, on the energy flow, then you see those prices go to the roof. So Switzerland could have 100% renewable forever at about seven cents per kilowatt hour without any ups and downs. So for me, it's a no brainer, it's a good solution. Yeah, it's a wonderful solution. Okay, so and the thing with Switzerland is that they don't even have sun from November to to March. It's very very <laughs> cloudy out there, but they, they still can do yeah. it. Even Switzerland, huh? So okay. So, all right, so first, you know, you you touch on some really key points. One is that uh, with the prices today, solar is competitive, even on a wholesale basis, but then when you get down to the retail basis and you're dealing with local situations, clearly it's cheaper. And I have case after case of the commercial uh, clients that I deal with, government, nonprofit, and businesses who are saving piles of money by moving the solar and putting them either on site or negotiating long-term 
power purchase agreements that are dramatically cheaper for retail. Wholesale, it's cheaper. And then, okay, Richard, so tell us how you deal with the nighttime and the cloud issues. What are those elegant solutions that you're talking about? Okay, so let's take a case uh, like New York State or any, any, any northern country. So you, you have two deficits for solar, you have night and you have clouds in winter. So there are three ways to, to resolve that. First is to use storage. Energy storage is getting cheaper. Second is to couple solar with other renewables that have an, another uh, output, like wind in New York. With the wind tends to shine, it tends to blow more when the sun doesn't and vice versa. There is more wind in winter. There's less sun in winter. There is more wind at night generally. So that there is a good balance between the two. And the third one is out of the box. The solution in fact entails wasting roughly a third of the solar output, throwing it out. What? Wasting it's, a third, throwing out a third of yeah, the solar you, generation? What? You overbuild and you curtail. And that's the, that's mm. the one that makes it happen big time. So how does that work? Go ahead, tell us how that works. So when when you overbuild PV, you produce more when in the times when when the production is low in winter time. So you need much much less long term storage. In fact, you don't need in Switzerland. You don't even need long term storage at all. You can get by with about ten hours of battery storage to reach those low costs. Hmm. But as part of the design, you have to overbuild PV and waste some of the output. So you overbuild it. It's totally counterintuitive, but it works. That's what I say. Look at the numbers, and the numbers don't lie. Yeah. So, so the basic idea is that instead of building and having it reach its maximum output during the summer months, what you're doing is you're overbuilding. You're going to have excess during the summer, but you're building enough to ha carry you through the winter and cloudy. Absolutely. Period. And wow. PV is getting so inexpensive that you can actually do that. Yeah, so the price of solar electricity since uh, since it was started has come down like 99%. We keep seeing these, you know, dramatic reductions. So, um, I mean, is that a trend that you see and that's why this is now possible? Is because the prices have come down so dramatically? Absolutely, and they are, they are still going to come down according to IEA and Bloomberg and Lazard Bank. They're gonna go down another 50% in the next 10 years and another 50% after that in the next following 10 years. Okay, so now you have a couple of different solutions. Basically, what you're saying we can do to get to 100% renewables and get off of these fossil fuels is one, we can move to solar. We build more than we need during our peak summer times, which right now is the most expensive time, but we build more than we need then. We have enough solar to carry us through the winter, so we have excess solar during the winter. We complement mm -hmm. that with wind energy and or other forms of renewables. And then we have some, hydro, yeah. And we have hydro in Switzerland. We also have hydro in New York, which is still almost 20% yeah. of the state's electricity. And it's the cheapest mm -hmm. source of power in New York because that's the great thing about renewables. When you build the infrastructure, you maintain the infrastructure, the water flows, you get free electricity. The wind blows, you get free electricity. The sun shines, you get free electricity. And it's not free because you had to pay for the infrastructure. But once you build the infrastructure and maintain it, you get free power thereafter, which is tremendous. So, okay, so you complement that. You have some battery storage, fantastic. Fantastic. Now the question always becomes, well, great, but you know, there's not enough room. There's, we don't have enough land to put the solar. We don't want to be cutting down trees and forests. And we've got all environmentalists up in arms about this stuff and taking out farmland is a real concern. So how do we deal with those issues? Yeah, and we, in fact, we just published a paper on, on that subject. And if you want to read all the, the peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed paper that we published, the easiest way to find what I, what I published is to go on Google Scholar, Google Scholar, Richard Perez, and you will have all my papers listed. I think now they're told almost 300 of them from way back. But the latest one, in the, in the more recent one, we have a paper called uh, Where to Deploy PV, and we look at land use and what can happen. So, so go ahead. Yeah, for, for space wise, 
I, I like to look at uh, corn ethanol, for instance, uh, just to, to give a contrast. So corn so, ethanol, yeah. so we've been doing corn ethanol mm -hmm. for what, like 20 years in this country, something Forever, like that, right? Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, once you, if you get gasoline, there is ethanol in there, most uh -huh. likely, like 5% yep. that comes from corn. The, the thing is that mm -hmm. the conversion efficiency from sun to the energy you use from corn ethanol, I'd say is at best 0.2%, 0.2%. Wow. Because it's a plant, it, 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 it doesn't produce solar energy efficiently. It grows and what you get at the energy at the end of the day is not very high. Plus you have to put tons of energy in it to make it grow in the first place. So the bottom line, some people say it's even negative, but let's assume that it's slightly positive. You compare that to photovoltaics, which is 20, 25% today. Here you have it's 100 times more efficient per acre than corn. So that in itself is, is, a, is a fair enough comparison. You take the 30 million acres of corn ethanol in the US, you could deploy almost four terawatts of PV, or just about eight times what the US electrical production is today. So uh, let, let me just get this straight. So if we just converted our corn ethanol, millions of fields. acres worth of fields that are already there just producing corn that can basically be grown, the only thing that corn is good for is to grow to put and distill and put into gasoline, we could create four times more energy electricity than we're currently using? Is that what you just said? That's a fair, yeah. Wow. Not even stretching the numbers in that case. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And um, so that means then that we could not only produce all the electricity that we need for our current usage, but we can also make this transition to a fully electric society and change out our transportation system with electric vehicles and change out our heating and cooling system with heat pumps, air and ground source heat pumps. Is that you could pretty do much that. right? That would make yeah. it happen. And we so, could do something to keep in mind. Re relative to electrification and i'll be happy to talk about it in another podcast maybe next year when i'm more first into that Elect electrification is probably the way to go but it's there is a, there is a fail safe solution from solar if we cannot electrify everything we will never be able to electrify planes for instance because the energy density is not good enough for most ships but there is something at the horizon that's find very exciting, it's called e-fuels. So you, you produce uh, hydrogen with PV or wind. You mix that with carbon you extract from the atmosphere. And with that, you can do just about any fuel you want down the line, including uh, synthetic gasoline. Wow. wow. And that's, that's totally environmentally clean. You, you just, it's pure solar energy, that, but it's in the form of fuel at the end of the day. And that could mesh wow. into the, the actual infrastructure without having to reinvent everything. Right. So that, that's a good plan B if we fail to electrify everything in the first place. Okay. So that kind of falls that's into the low really carbon, cool. the low carbon fuel standard types of ideas, right? So um, the no carbon fuel, right. the zero, ca zero no carbon, carbon which is even better, right? Although I, yeah. I will say though, I have to say that I've seen some of the latest research on capacitors, which are pretty incredible devices. And then also um, planes that now are starting planes and other transport that are starting to use yeah. batteries. And, and they, they may, yeah, they may, they may make it happen. All it will take anyway. is, a, is a lighter battery. Yeah. If they so, can do that. Wonderful. So the good news is that we have these advances in technology that are making, you know, almost anything possible and that this is totally doable and it's just a crazy. And it all comes from TV, from solar. Yeah. And it all comes from the sun, mm -hmm. right? Which is uh, that little ball in the sky that we revolve around that we never think about, but it's up there providing us with constant energy and creating the opportunity for life on earth in, period, in general. You bet. Wonderful things. All right. So, so uh, you know, right now we're in the midst of this worldwide, uh, you know, crazy situation with the Ukraine and Putin and Russia. And then we got the Middle East going crazy. How, how do you see this stuff evolving, Richard? How, what do you see as kind of the steps that we are, are need to take? And, and how do you see who, who's doing a good job of doing that, too? So first, what are the steps we need to take and who's doing a good job to get us so that we're finally free of these uh, 
crazy despots and terrorists and all these other fossil fuel interests that uh, really control our lives? Well, uh, the best job would be for everybody that makes decisions in this country and in other countries that want to go in the right direction, just to sit down and look at the number. And if they look at it, they will find that the cheapest, easiest way is to deploy uh, the renewables in a smart way. The thing is that we're not doing it in the smartest possible way today. It's like the mismatch of things. Utilities are fighting against uh, developers because each one wants their piece of the turf. So at the end of the day, we don't have the optimum solution developing. I don't hear anybody in New York State yet or in any, any place except in Switzerland, they're starting to listen to us. Something about wasting PV to, to reach the, the low cost point for everybody. And the difference can be enormous. If you want to save every little kilowatt hour of your PV system, you're going to have to build a giant seasonal storage that, that's going to make the whole thing unaffordable. If you build it with a design in mind that, okay, I'm building my PV resource, but I know I'm going to waste 50% of it by design, then you're going to reach prices which are very low. And if you think about it, that's a little bit like nature works. A, a tree is there, but it wastes 90% uh, of the sun it receives. That's, that's just the way it is. We have so, so much sun and we can afford to, to waste a little bit. So, okay, so we need to do it smarter. And what do you see as the stumbling blocks to us doing it smarter? What is it about Switzerland that makes them different from, let's say, New York or the rest of the, the, rest of the world? Well, they, they did ask the right question and they asked my colleagues in Switzerland who in turn asked me to to get them a plan to go ahead. So let's just sit down and, and look at the big picture, look at the forest, and, and then you can worry about the tree. Currently, we look at all the trees and we are trying to get them, fit them together, but never step back and look at the, at the forest and, and devise a plan from there. All right. So if we were to look at New York, which is where I'm based, but uh, and uh, there's a lot of work going on right now with, you know, some very aggressive policies. Um, what do you see as the challenges in New York? Challenges in New York? Uh, well, you don't have the right policies to, to deploy TV the, the right way. So if I had my way, and I know I won't, but what I would suggest is that every new installation that comes online today will be designed to deliver load shape, which is your PV system. Any new PV system is bundled with the right amount of storage, coupled with the right amount of wind and maybe hydro. So the ensemble delivers something that looks like load demand. So all you do at the end of the day is reduce what has what the other resource have to meet. Instead of that, we're trying to develop uh, PV and wind as, as run of the weather resources. So they come online, they create management, load management issues, market issues, ramp rates, and you have to forecast and you have to manage everything. So, so we go in the wheels, we develop the stuff and we, we make a mess out of something where we could actually make it happen that every new thing that comes online is totally clean and, and looks like the load and that so if we did that today that would be more for say your customers than net metering but here comes the a business plan id the, the, you know business plan curve you start with a with a project it's gonna you know it, you're gonna be in the red for 10 15 years and then you're gonna cross over and then you're gonna be in the black forever so firm pv generation 24 365 pv and wind would work the same way your customers would accept to curtail some of their output but they would be paid uh, the right amount to do so so instead of chasing every kilowatt hour from their net metering, like they do today, injecting uh, viable power on the grid, they would be paid for the fact that their installation is there, as is associated with the right amount of storage somewhere nearby, maybe even on their premises with the right amount of wind, and the whole thing works. 
So oh. that's what I would like to see, someone that could actually change the, make the regulation so that this kind of solution can develop. Excellent, outstanding. And would that be the state legislature? Would that be the Public Service Commission that regulates the utilities? Would be all of them. Mm -hmm. um, but there, there is tons of learning curve. I mean, I, I don't know anybody in the legislature or the PSC that knows that you have to curtail PV to make it mm. the cheapest resource for everybody. That's mm -hmm. totally unknown. It's, mm -hmm. So first, they have, they have to get on speed. And I, I've been trying to do that. I've not been the most successful. I've, I've talked to the to the PSC a few times in my life, and uh, well, I've not been successful. I must say, not yet. So you know, like <laughs> not all... coming from a position of strength and twisting their arms so they understand. All right. So in New York, we now have this new plan to roll out. How many gigawatts? Uh, how many uh, megawatts, Eva? Uh, I think we have currently the plan is for six gigawatts of PV, but it will go beyond that. We all know that. Yeah, no, they just came out with another plan. I think that that takes. I think that pretty much doubles that, or pretty close to okay. it. Okay. So, so, so mm -hmm. as we look at this, I know you guys have been working together on dealing with communities that are looking at large solar projects. And what kind of opposition are you encountering? And where is that coming from? And and where what what, what are you guys doing about it? Well, I'm, I'm going to let Eva take take the lead on that because she's in the trenches fighting fighting those things, but we're doing many things about it. Yeah, so um, something that we see pretty often is concern about property values um, of nearby residents decreasing with solar projects nearby. Um, this is something that has been being studied for a long time. There's still new things coming out about it. So, you know, it's, it's not really totally valid, um, but even if it were to decrease property value by a little bit of the ones that are very close by, you know, um, the benefits that it brings to communities that solar, a solar project brings to communities, you know, through funding of schools, pilots, com host community benefits of for local businesses and organizations, um, and just the revenue that it brings to a community um, would outweigh, you know, a slight decrease in property value. Um, another thing that we see pretty often is concerns about flooding um, and other, you know, environmental concerns, which um, solar actually, you know, <laughs> through planting meadows underneath solar panels, it, the roots help absorb, you know, uh, stormwater runoff, and it actually would be decreasing flooding. And, um, you know, people also think health concerns with um, you know, chemicals leaching through stormwater runoff and um, just at the end of the day with proper soil management on your soil pro or solar projects, um, you know, you're reducing the use of agrochemicals and therefore cleaning up waterways and stormwater runoff. So those are a couple of things. So it's another way of basically making best use of the land, which is having solar producing clean electricity, but then also growing either some sort of uh, crops and or um, in your agrivoltaics piece, I have uh, recently been watching you talk about bees and harvesting and, uh, and honey mm -hmm. fields. And sheep, yeah. And sheep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so multiple, yeah. multiple uses, so you get multiple uses out of the same land, right? Mm -hmm. And how have uh, how have people how have people been responding to that? Does that make sense to them? Um, yeah, yeah, it's something that a lot of people haven't you know ever heard of before or thought about. But then once you educate folks on that, um, they they realize how cool it is and that you can make use of the land more so than just solar. It's not not just some massive power plant that's next to your, you know, in your community, it can be beautiful and have, you know, wonderful, like wildflowers and pollinators and all of that good stuff. And um, there is this study and I don't want to say where it's from because I might say the wrong place. 
Um, but I can find the link or something later. But um, it's been shown that if you host pollinators, you know, apiaries on your uh, solar project, it actually has shown to increase the yield of corn and soy crops in nearby fields by 18%, which is pretty cool too. So not only hmm. is it helping, it helps the nearby farms. Outstanding. So, yeah. uh, so Richard, when we take a look at, you know, how are we going to get all this solar and we want to build more than we're going to consume during the summer. So we want to overbuild and then, uh, you know, get rid of some of it, which by the way, is getting rid of some of it could be initially just putting it into battery car, battery powered cars. But um, in any case, so where, if you were to take a look, I remember at one point you had looked at, if we just put solar in certain places, just on top of buildings or just on roadways or just on existing parking lots and such, um, would that be enough or do we need to do it in, in it big would be fields? More than enough. So the, the big, big things, uh, so let's say we're gonna use 2% of, of farmland and that's all, all of the corn ethanol, leaving it aside for now, just say 2% of, of farms to do agrivoltaic, which is not a lot. Use the right of ways, power line right of ways occupy so much space in, in the States, uh, everywhere. Uh, and that's in our publication. If you go on Google Scholar, you'll find it. And you use the, the footprint of the automobiles. So 10 years from now, 15 years from now, every everything on the road will be a, a pv plant in addition to being a battery powered thing because there is so much space available on the outside of, of cars to to produce enough electricity to 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 do half of the transportation output just just on the footprint of the cars themselves so how come no one's done that yet i mean i've seen no no it's it's, it's it's getting started okay uh, there is a new field in uh, i triple e conference that I go to called VIPV, Vehicle Integrated PV. Uh -huh. And all the, the big players, Toyota, Tesla, they have, they're starting to have prototypes with, with PV integrated in the shell of the vehicle. Yeah, I mean, it's um, been tried but, multiple times. Mm -hmm. Is it just that the efficiency was never good enough and the price was too much? Is that what hasn't? Uh... Oh, just uh, it was ill-suited to serve the market. But now if you have a trickle charge from a PV and you're the outside shell of the car is PV, then goes really well with electric cars. Yeah, right, right. So, so. Uh, the, the technology, it's hard to bend the cells to the shape of a car and to make them the color you want. But mm. I'm, I'm sure 15 years from now, you'll have PV of any color you want to fit on any shape you want. Ah, it's the color That's we got to get. We got to get our colors right. Red PV. Ah, yeah. I don't want. I don't want a PV colored car. I want my blue, red, orange colored. Okay. That's <laughs> and, and you could have that. I've, I've seen PV panels at European conferences because they like to to have the design aspect that we don't always have in the US. Uh -huh. I've seen PV PV panels for sale of every color on the rainbow out there. Wow! Cool. Awesome. Oh my god! Fantastic. Wonderful. That's All cool. right. So uh, what lessons would you say you've learned over the years, Richard? And um, and what are you doing differently now than, than what you used to do? Uh, what good lesson is don't, don't fight. If you have wings against you, don't, don't go against it. Try to find a way where it blows your way and you can make it happen that way. So go, go with the flow and shape the flow. Excellent. And we, we like to ask if there's a, a particular unique, we call them sort of a supernova value statement, something that people haven't thought about. Maybe maybe it's that we need to overbuild PV, but is there anything yeah. else? Is that the Think main outside one? the box, yeah. Think overbuild. outside the box. All right. Yeah. And what's the one thing you're I most think... at? Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Eva. Oh, I was just going to say one of the things I've learned from Dr. Perez um since working with him that really is the, one of the biggest takeaways for me is just how little of the land i know he said you know less than two percent of new york state farmland would need to be used it's, it's really not that much and the efficiency of panels is getting so much better every year another thing that i know from dr perez so it's that's so you, one of my yeah. biggest things from him yeah, and then, um, you know, a lot of this farmland is fallow. And then if we don't provide these farmers with some sort of revenue, which what PV can do, um, a lot of times Absolutely. they sell they sell, and then we get a development. And then, you know, it's 
farmland's gone and you got an even worse situation right so so mm-hmm. a much better alternative wonderful all right thank you um so what's the one thing you're most energized about today you guys today uh twitter no <laughs> <laughs> Uh huh. Yeah. Oh, you're really enthused about Elon owning owning the uh, the conversation, huh? <laughs> Go ahead, Richard. Right. Now, the energize is that um, when when I look at at the, at the long term of TV, it's it's been growing exponentially, like 25, 20 percent every year since I got started, even when it was totally outside of the radar. And if you project just that thing simple growth rate in the future, it's going to be overwhelming. It's going to be in your face. Sorry, my phone just got started and I'm creating background noise, but. Yeah, we, we yeah. can uh, we can cut that out. So why don't we do that part again? Can you turn off your phone for a second and then we'll cut this sure. little chunk out. So. Um... Oh, oh, it's across the room. So sorry. I didn't mean, I didn't know you had to get up. To yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> All okay. right. All right. So let's do it again. So what's the one thing you're most energized about today? So it's looking at TV growth over time. Since, almost since I got started in that business, it's been growing at 20, 25% every year, even when it was nothing. So it's been following an exponential by definition, something that grows at a constant rate is an exponential. And one of the very important thing about exponentials that you don't even notice they are there until you start noticing them. And when you start noticing them, then they blow up uh, exponentially, quote unquote, but they've always been an exponential. So PV is getting big, even if if nothing changed, it's, it's, it's growing at 25% a year. And, if you project that number 10, 15 years from now, it's going to be enough to power everything. Yeah, it's amazing, so it's right? it's there to stay. Outstanding. Yeah, I mean, you know, anybody that doesn't believe it, just take a look at your smartphone. <laughs> yeah. There were no smartphones when I was growing up. There wasn't even a concept about a smartphone, except for maybe Dick Tracy's watch. But uh, different conversation for another generation, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, Eva, how about you? What, what are you most energized about today? I'm most energized about Yusa's new solar film series is almost of course. complete, and we are looking very much forward to sharing that with the public. It's going to be three 60-second films um, really highlighting um, economic benefits that communities can get um, through hosting a solar project. So um, super excited to get that out there and hopefully start creating more. Outstanding. Well, if you guys were a chance, yeah. Did you have a chance to see them? I did. They're amazing. Okay. Yeah, I think they're fantastic. Mm-hmm. So thank you very much. I can't wait to uh, that they're out and can share them with everybody. So thank you for that. All right. So uh, we're coming up to the end of our time here. Grand finale. If you would share a piece of parting advice and the best way folks can contact you. Yeah. Follow the sun. Go, mm. go to Google Scholar for me or who you says they have contact with you. Hey, Eva? Um, trying to think of a good piece of advice. I'll start with uh, my contact information. So you can um, firstly email me eva at usesusa.org. So eva at usesusa.org. Um, my piece of advice would be to, um, I don't know, I guess, Take, uh, I don't know. Uh, I like follow the sun. We'll just take Richard's piece. Follow yeah, the sun. To, check out the numbers. Take the easy way yeah. yeah. Check yeah. out the numbers. Follow the sun. <laughs> check out the numbers. Follow the sun. Great. Wonderful. Anything that uh, that you guys wanted to touch on that we missed? No, I think we covered a lot today. So it was great talking to you. Great, Eva. Mm-hmm. Anything? Um. No. Just. Stay tuned to see our solar film series and find any more information about uses at our website, usesusa.org. Great. 
Well, thank you so much, you guys, folks. Um, all the uh, the notes will have different uh, contact pieces of information. And once again, it's the United Solar Energy Supporters, or USES, USA.org, and Dr. Richard Perez of SUNY Atmospheric Sciences, who's also world-renowned and going over to Italy for a month to teach this mm -hmm. summer. Um, so thank you, you guys, so much for your time and your insights and great studies. And thank you for coming on the show. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye, Ron. Thanks for having us. Yeah.